Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on Quarkus. Today, I'm going to talk about what's Quarkus and why it's called a shrink, shrink rate to your Java application. So this is Kamesh, uh, live from uh, Bangalore, uh, and probably uh, doing my probably the last session for this year. Maybe like I'll come back with more sessions next year, and hopefully we will do it live right in person. So that's my thing we keep in cross. A uh, few logistics before I go further uh, on this session is one is that you can grab the links of the slides I put down there, the bit.ly link right below on my screen right now. So you see this bit.ly link, bit.ly, Quarkus, Java, Shrinkray. So that's going to be the place where you can grab the slides that I'm going to share with you. And all the demonstrations that I'm going to show you are all part of a tutorial, dn.dev Quarkus tutorial. I'll walk through the tutorial uh, in a few seconds or during the, during the session so that you can go and grab those commands as well. And don't worry if you miss the commands, right? I want you to understand what things are and how to do use Quarkus for your application, right? Uh, with that, so let's get started. Um, so what I do, uh, probably there will be a small change to my, okay? Uh, this is what I do. So uh, I'm director for developer experience. I have put down my email address and been an open source contributor for quite some time. And I put on my LinkedIn, Twitter, and all of the handles for you to grab. I think you can just follow me on there. If you have any questions, obviously, please do drop me an email. Uh, my email address there, I'll be happy to answer a question. Uh, and also, like, uh, please feel to grab the copy of my book, which is free to download from developers.data.com. The download link is there. dn.dev slash knative cookbook is all about serverless and how to use knative. Right. So with that, so I'll be watching the chat as well. So uh, you can just keep popping your questions whenever you have, so that I'll be happy to answer the questions of the chat. I'll keep monitoring it on and off during the small breaks which we have during the session. Uh, and also, like obviously, as I told you, like I given my Twitter handle, email address, and every stuff. Probably you can go ahead and uh, drop me a note there as well. Okay. Before we go further, talk about what shrink ray, why I call this right. So just think for a second, like why we need Quarkus. So why we bought with this little Quarkus thing is because we have a lot of Java frameworks in the market and why why in Red Hat, like we started this project and we upstreamed it as usual and then why it's getting so famous right now, right? What's the what's the super thing about it and why we need it, all right? So let's answer this question, why we need Quarkus first, right? So let's go here. Let's imagine a case for a second, right? Uh, what you are doing right now in the microservices world, what you basically do is like, I just take my Java application, Maven clean package or Gradle build or whatever you want, uh, and then make a jar, which is an executable jar, what we call it Uber jar. And then we just do Java dash jar start my application. Fantastic, my application is up and running. But we always have a few things, right? So we always say, okay, my Java application is always slow, it's fat. It's not, it's not responsive, it's loading loads, taking so much of memory, blah, blah, blah. We have a lot of things, right? And always like the performance tune Java application is always been a nightmare, right? There is no place where we can go to the perfect thing. But if you just imagine why was this case, why Java was slow, right? Because we are in a cloud native world right now, but when we started with Java and Java application was that we are more like a traditional world, right? A client server, an application server was running, we were starting the application running. But things have changed right now. Right? We are moving towards the cloud native world where we want application to be start like this on any any VM or any cloud where they're running. But why Java was slow, right? Let's see a few things what I listed on my screen, right? There is a lot of startup overhead whenever we start Java as jar, right? So we have class path, we have to do a class path scanning, we have to load jars from the disk, do some annotation processing, build the metadata, and also like we have to do the JIT in code, right? Just in time compiling. And also, like we get the memory over it also, right? The classes get loaded. There's a metadata as you see on the screen below, RSS, resident set size. So this is the actual memory that your Java application is going to consume when it's running and responding to your request, right? When you read more about resident set size, there's a link below which I put down. But if you see there's also heap, there's a meta space and half heap, right? Half heap is more like a disk, right? We take it from heap and offload it onto a disk. But meta space is something which is never garbage collected. Most of the times, meta space doesn't have garbage collected, and, and we have things whenever new classes get loaded or something new is done, it keep accumulating it, and that's where your memory becomes bloated, right? And one point, one point of time, Java things start crashing, or you have to increase your XMS and XMS and all these stuff, which makes it work. But if you think for a second, why this is right? So let's go and think. So why this is done, and why Quarkus? How Quarkus is going to help you? Let me go here and start with the traditional way of doing things. Imagine a case I have a Hibernate-based or JPA-based application, okay, for that matter. 
So let's let's do the sequence of steps that I basically do for taking this application from build time into runtime, right? That's what you see in these two things. So basically, I do Maven package as I said earlier, and then start building Maven package, Maven clean package, and my applications are, and then give it to uh, your your container or Docker container, whatever it is that you just do Java dash jar. The application is going to start, right? So as I told you, it's a JP application. It's talking to a MySQL database or PostgreSQL or whatever database you name it. Now what happens, I have to first load the JPA entity, which is an XML basically. Now what happens, since I have to load this XML, I have to have an XML parser. So the XML parser is going to come here and start loading this application. So the XML parser has multiple set of dependencies. That's also get me to load in the classes. And everything is done. I have to scan the entity, realize the entity, and then make all the database connections, and then do all those database schema realization from ORM to this, and all of the stuff. And then finally, I build a dependency graph, and then give it to run. But if you just pause for a second and think, why I should do all these things in runtime? Why can't I do all this in build time? Right? For example, like if I want to load everything, like I know which database I'm going to talk to, I know which are the entities it's going to be there, I know what all the things that is required for me to load and pass these entities and realize the schema. And I have all these things. Why can't I load at a build time and do indexing of all those things so that my application is faster? That's exactly what Quarkus does for you, right? With Quarkus, we change the way by which we start the application, right? By which the application is built. We kind of get this things, all these what we call as Quarkus augmentation. I'll talk about that a bit later. But what we basically do right now is that we do all those things from a traditional way, moving most of the things which could also all be done at build time and make the dependency graph ready at the build time as part of Jandex, Java index. I'll put the links as well for that. And then that's where we go and we have these things here, right? And then you see this blue color jar, which is the argumented, quarters argumented jar, which means that it knows all the information that it needs to run the application. But the benefit is that I know everything has been done in build time, right? I've done everything at build time so that my application is ready to start the moment I say Java dash job. Does this make sense? I think so. So because this is a this is the big thing which we made from Quarkus from a traditional application into Quarkus. That's the thing we did. Thought, okay, with Quarkus, let's start doing all these things, make sure that the application is done at build time rather than at runtime. And also, what we also did is like, so we made a beautiful jar, which is kind of an optimized jar, what is called a Quarkus augmented jar. And let's do a little bit more thing, right? We enhanced, we used leverage GraalVM and made sure that my application is kind of made the local binary, which means that since I know everything what I need for, us, for this particular application to run, why can't I make it binary, right? I don't have JVM dependency, anything, so that it can run even 30% more faster. Right? And also we did an aggressive dead code elimination. That's what Graal is famous for. And then give you a single path execution so that my application is fast and quicker. That's exactly what we did with this, right? And you will be wondering like, what's the benefit of this? Benefit of this is that your Java application was made 10x smaller and 100x faster. You, you, you really believe this, right? I think because this is what we did to the Java application, make sure that my Java application is faster, 10x smaller, and 100x faster, and fit for the cloud native world. We'll talk about more about the fitness in a second. But the, the here real thing is that I made my Java application 10x smaller and 100x faster, which means that there's a faster boot up time, lesser memory also, all right? And adding to that, I also had a few things which is called as a developer joy, right? I can just do, I'll, I'll talk, I'll show the demonstration of a developer joy. I'll come back to this in a second, okay? Which means that Quarkus will be on, okay, all I do is a build time, right? Quarkus is not a framework. Yes, Quarkus is not a framework, it's a stack, it's a build tool. End of the day, what you understand from what I explained, but eventually this is not a, just a build tool, it's a smarter build tool, right? Because I do lots of augmentation, I remove a few things out from the runtime, make sure that my runtime is faster and quicker and all of this stuff. I make sure that this is the faster build tool. Okay. That's great. So let's see some demo. Right? I've done enough talking about how Quarkus works and all of this stuff. Let's go quickly to see the demo, right? Before I go to demo, uh, where you can see stuff, right? So this is where you can go and find Quarkus project. So this is Quarkus.io. So let me go here and load the link, Q-A-R-K-U-S.io. That's where you can go and get started with Quarkus. The current release is 1.9.2, okay? And then the Quarkus tutorial is right here. I put on the bit.ly link on the chat. Uh, that's where you can go grab this Quarkus tutorial. We are updating it for the new releases and we keep them updated. So you can go find them here. So that's where is your Quarkus tutorial. And this is what it looks like, like what we talk about. I'm gonna show you a bunch of demos today, not all, but few. 
Um, you can go try them search by yourself, starting with requirements, how do I set up my local environment, all of the stuff, right? But I'll give you a few tips on this particular demonstration. So this is where you can go find your Quarkus stuff. You can just talk about Quarkus. How do I do play with Quarkus myself? All right. Uh, and then, so let's go and start and do a quick demonstration, right? So um, I'm on VS Code right now. Uh, I'll just show you VS Code for you because in the VS Code, if you go here, uh, you can go then find out Quarkus. Okay, there's a Quarkus plugin from Red Hat. I've already installed it. If you don't install it, you can just do an installation of that. So this plugin allows you to quickly create Quarkus project from within VS Code. That's what I'm going to show you a demonstration. You can also do that from a command line you can Quarkus Maven plugin, but I'll rely, I'll stay back to using the IDE for most of the time and shift back to command line whenever I need the command line. I'm more a command line guy than this, right? So um, that's what I'm going to do right now. So uh, let's go here and then do something. So let's start the first thing. So first, what you're going to do is like making the application smaller. Let me see the notes, what I want to show you guys. I want to show you uh, how to make my application, build applications in Quarkus, the first thing you should do. So if you go to the command palette, um, there's something called as generate Quarkus project. Okay, this is the first thing which you can do. Click on this. And this is going to take you to the Quarkus application right now. It's going to activate extensions. I'm going to use Maven. I'm going to use some package name. So, okay. And then I'm going to say, uh, call it a fruit resource, fruit app. That's the usual thing which I use here. And give a version, and this is a package, and I have one. I'm going to have one resource, which is called the fruit resource. Okay, this is a traditional exam. I'm just using the same example as that's there in the tutorial, so that it's easy for you to go and do it back, right? And I'm just going to use Jaxar as alone right now for my REST API. I'm just going to use this, and then put an enter, right? And then it should take some time to ask you where to do it. I'm just going to generate here, so that's going to generate me a Quarkus project and open that uh, in this window, right? So this is what your Quarkus project is, right? Right. I'm just going to have a Quarkus project here. So you see this here. So what basically I have done is that let me. Uh, I think if this. Let me see if this is too bigger or smaller. Okay. Um, I think this is visible. Let me see if this is visible for you guys. So it's my is my font and other stuff visible. It's easy for you to grok, or you want me to make it smaller. Okay, uh, so what basically this has done for us is that it has unscaffolded a project for me. So with the typical Maven project, uh, and then you see the Quarkus version and other stuff, bunch of dependencies. One dependencies we said is that we want a uh, REST uh, thing. We just had a client and a JSON B. I don't, I'll talk about client a bit later. We just have a REST EC and all of the stuff, right? The traditional which is there. And then there's a plugin uh, which basically compiles your Maven. That's what is this. this is typical Maven project that has been scaffolded. We'll come back to native in a second. So that's what is being done with this, right? I can do the same stuff from a command line also, right? I have a plugin called as what is Maven plugin. I'm just going to put this here like this. Let me make it bigger. MVN uh, IO Quarkus Maven plugin. I can give the version dot nine dot two dot final. Colon create. Okay, there's the same command which I can do. We're going to get a CLI soon so that I can just do Quarkus CLI create, right? Something like that. So for now, you have to rely on this plugin. So this plugin is going to scan your project and do a bunch of other stuff. It's exactly the same like what you saw just now, right? It's it's what I did from this thing. This is what it's doing here. It's going to ask you a set of questions, and then I say okay, 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 right? And then I say yes, and then hello resource, and then path. That's it, right? So you're just going to have one more project here. Which is called as my Quarkus project. So you can either use VS Code plugin or there's an IDEA plugin also available. Eclipse plugin is also available. Whichever IDE you are comfortable with, you can use that. But I just showed you the quick way of using from Visual Studio Code, which was pretty fast and easy for you. All right. And then I also showed you the Maven way. I usually prefer the command line for me, but uh, just showed you this way as well. All right. So we're good here. So let's go here. And see what else it has generated for me. It has generated a Docker. Okay, we'll come back to that a bit later. A set of Docker templates where I can build the application as a container. So we'll talk about that probably at the end of the session. And then we have a Java package, and then where I got the fruit resource created, right? I just have a path called as Press DC API, which is going to say and hello for me right now. Okay. 
So with that, so what I'm going to show you is that I'm just going to start this application on the command line. So let me, okay, let me do this. Uh, let me push this on to the first third side of this. And then this one, I'll put this on the last third, okay? Uh, okay. And then so that I, I'm doing a little bit of arrangement for the screen so that uh, I can show you both these things side by side. All right, I'm just going to do a compilation. So we just say Maven. Uh, okay, before that, I just want to do one little thing uh, just to save color coding. I can also get the corpus uh, and sole color. So that, like, I'll just come back to that later. I'm just disabling the color here. I'm just saying Maven W clean package. Okay, oh, sorry. I need to go to the fruit app project and then say clean package. So just going to do a typical build for Java application that's what you're seeing on my screen. And once the application is built, so let me make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so that like these two screens are pretty easy. And I'll just uh, make the font a little bit smaller uh, so that it's uh, it's easier to read uh, as well okay right so now my application is done and let's go and watch the target folder right ls dash ldrh target and now if you see this this runner jar is what we're going to use which is like 257 kilobytes that's the size of the jar like right? that's what we said that we made is 10x smaller Right, because we are not packaging, we are not relying on the Uber jar because Uber jar is bad for cloud native world. So we, that because of all the problems which we discussed earlier, what I'm right now doing is that I'm just going to go and say this snapshot.jar, which is less 257k. All right. And then obviously, or going back to the old traditional way, all the libraries are put down in lib directory so that you can refer them from within your class, right? Great. So we've done this. So how do I start this? Java dash jar. I'm going to start this one. Uh, uh jar target uh fruit tap runner you have to use the runner jar and there we go and now your corpus application is running uh what you call maybe like it started in uh 1.136 seconds right you see this probably like there you see that the bit of delay because i'm streaming and doing so some amount of cp is occupied so if you see this, the Quarkus application was started in 1.136 seconds, right? This is the speed at which your Quarkus application is started, right? So this is what I said earlier, right? And the lovely thing about this is also that this is the first thing we start. Your application is started in 1.136 seconds. That's your normal JVM mode, right? If you want to do hotspot mode, um, that's what we're going to do. And now when I'm going to do in the native mode, right? I said like I can also do MVN. I can also use the name wrapper if you want to be a package. Uh, I say there's a native compiler. That's what Graal is going to come into picture now. I'm going to take the argumented jar. Uh, your argumented jar is what you see here on the target folder, the snapshot jar, jar, the runner jar. So this is a Quarkus argumented jar. I'm going to take this jar and then give it to Graal. So one of the problems when you use Graal is that we have to give the right parameters for Graal to go and compile the application. Then when you get the benefits of this. That's what I'm going to do right now. Quarkus takes that thing from responsibility from you and it knows that I have built this jar. I know what parameter that I need to pass. That's what I'm going to do right now. So if you see this, so this is going to start building this application in a native mode, which means that I'm going to get a binary right now. I'm going to get a dot runner binary. That's what is going to see that right now. Uh, the native build will take a bit of time. Initially, if you see this one, I'm just running the Graal native image command here. So that's going to pass the right parameters that is required for Graal to run. And then it's kind of building my application in that way. Okay. So this is what I'm trying to write to do now is, is Graal with this one. And then it's kind of building my application and running my application. Okay. So let me go here a little bit. And then it might take some time. So while it, I think it takes a minute, uh, it's a little bit more uh, than because they have to do the dead code elimination and binary conversion. It will take a little bit of CPU and memory as well. As you see, my CPU is climbing up here and my memory is also climbing up, right? So it takes a bit of that. And we'll wait for a few seconds for this to complete before we go to the next pieces of demonstrations. Uh, while I do that, let me see if I have any questions on the chat.
Um, and see if, if all good. I don't think so. There's any questions. Obviously, this is a recorded video. Obviously, you can come back and watch. As I told you earlier, you can also come back and get the questions uh, from me as well. Okay, on an email or something. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Right. Let's wait for uh, this thing to complete. Uh, once the, uh, the thing is completed, let's go back and start and start the same jar and see how it's going to done. Right. So let's go here. Let's wait for some time. You see the CPU is coming up and it's it's coming down, which means it's a, it's a, it's a thing that it's kind of done the job. It's going to come down and then give you the binary. So what is going to be generated for me? You see this jar that's getting generated on the right side here, the support tab runner jar. So that's going to be a macOS binary because I'm running I'm running this native image build on macOS, which means that it won't get a macOS binary. If you're running on Linux, you can get a Linux binary. And there are also other parameters which you can use to control what kind of stuff that needs to be generated. Okay. So I'm just going to say target and then uh, fruit app runner the jar. Uh, that's what I'm going to do right now and then say there there you go right so it's still going to say hello and then now if you see this this one was started in 0 0.021 seconds right that's the speed at which this application your java application has started for you in 0 0.021 seconds okay so that's what the difference between you get approximately you get 30 to 40 percent more faster booty boot up time when with, with quarkers uh with, with the binary mode and also similarly you'll also get the similar thing when you get the application deployed uh, into the cloud where you get lesser memory occupied so that you can deploy more application. We'll talk about that in detail in a few seconds. So what other things I can do? I talked about a developer joy, right? What the developer joy is all about, okay? So if you imagine for a second, okay, so let, let me put this uh, thing a little bit on this side. Uh, third, so that like I'll have a little bit more space and I'm going to say what I'm going to do right now so this is not this is not your fruit app, right? So this is not the fruit app is saying in this world is saying hello, right? Hello is not a fruit. Okay. So let's let's do what's a what's a usual developer way of building my application, right? When whenever a developer builds the application, right? The developer always says, Okay, I'm going to start my application, start deploying, start creating, and then what he basically does is that he goes back, changes the code, rebuilds, deploys into application server, and do the same thing again and again and again, right? But if you imagine for a second, when you want to do microservices, when you do something which is to be more productive, right? It will be nice if I can load the application on the fly. There are tools which I've been doing. I'll explain what Quarkus does a little bit differently than those tools, and also like how things are done, right? For a change, so how do I start a developer mode? Is that in mean W? I say compile Quarkus dev mode. Okay, so this is going to start a dev mode for me, and then now what? My application is going to run live, right? It's going to run live. I'll just put this. Here done and then now you see the application is running up up there for you and the quarkus application started and then started 1.1285 seconds great now if i go and do a curl right uh, let me do this i'm just going to start like this liquor http and then i say stc slash hello sorry it's on a path i'm going to get the hello string right this here so let me go and see, okay, I don't want hello, right? Hello is not the right one, right? So let me go and say, I want to change this to hello to return me like Apple. So that's going to be my fruit, which I want, right? For example, and you also will be with Quarkus plugin, you also get this nice one so that I can also open this in a browser window as well, okay? I'm not going to do that for now. I'm just going to still rely on my CLI to show you that as hello. And you see this application getting reloaded for you, right? I'm just getting Apple right here, but whereas my, I'm not start my application, my application is still running. I'm also going, I'm going to say that this is also running here. I started in 0.025 seconds, which is reloaded completely. And if you watch what happened right now, when the moment I did change and save, my application was not reloaded. And that's the difference between the tools that were doing earlier hot reload and Quarkus is that. And because the moment I do changes, there might be places, multiple places where I need to go and change stuff, right? That, that's expected. So because of that, what basically happens, I cannot go and reload it immediately because that will lead you a lot of compilation errors. So what I basically did here is that the so Quarkus waits for you to give a request again so that my application is recompiled and reloaded. So that's a big difference how Quarkus handles stuff. Now, I'm in a total joy as a developer that I can also load these stuff, et cetera, et cetera. All right? And a bit more stuff. Let me go and change the path. I'm going to say this call as API. 
uh, slash fruits, right? Okay. And now I'm going to say, uh, get one fruit. That's what I'm going to say. And then I'm going to say, this is going to get me uh, a JSON in case if I want to do. I say uh, application.json. Uh, I say JSON. And then I say, and also like it, the total thing is going to give me uh, consumes also a JSON. Okay. That's all W's. Okay. This is going to consume a JSON. This is going to give you a JSON here and it's going to JSON here, right? I'm just changing a little bit on this side. Now, instead of a fruit, how nice it will be, I'm just going to replace this with a property, right? Uh, default, call this default fruits or something, okay? And now what I'm going to say is that I'm going to get this from a property. This is the usual way I would do in a traditional Java application, right? But with Quarkus, without any extra dependencies, I can also rely on config property. So this is the Eclipse microprofile config property, which you see here right now. That's going to be injected here. And then what I can't say is like on the config property, I can say name equal to my.fruit. Now what happens, so this is going to be a fruit, which is not right there. And then it's going to say that if my fruit is not defined, then the default one is going to be apple. Default value, we're going to say apple here. All right. So I hope this... This is clear with you, right? How to actually do this, all right? So I'm just going to do this one. I just said a config property, and then I say default fruit, and then I go to pad. I just made a little bit of change here, okay? And now what basically happens is that this is going to get you the fruit here, right? The default fruit, all right? So let's go and see what happens to this. So obviously, I, I accidentally clicked the link so that like it loaded the fruit, and then let me go and change this one to be mango, okay? And come back here. Oh, let me here okay and then i go and change uh http i don't have this path anymore i should say api slash fruits right so that's going to give me the default one now you see i get this mango one which is the application.json because that's a content type i'm getting back and then i get my application got loaded okay so the config property my fruit does not exist. Let's see what happens when I go and change this fruit here, right? I just go to application properties and then let me split this in this window so that you can see on the right side. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to put this fruit here. Uh, sorry about that. So I'm going to put this fruit and then say uh, orange. Okay. Now what happens, I have a default value mango. If the property has this, then what happens, that property is going to get loaded, right? So that's what is going to happen for us right now. I'm just going to say again, fruits. Now you see orange is coming for us because now I don't need to rely on the default value. The property is loaded, but still I've not stopped my server. My server is still running, but my applications are happening. Everything is being done, but Quarkus is running in a development mode right now, which means that I can do all of the stuff like this. I changed the application properties. It loaded this thing. anything on the class path as well. To get it more interesting is what happens is that I can also go and add the POM XML changes that can also get these things up and running, right? Your application gets reloaded in a fraction of seconds. Let's go and do this, right? For that, I have to make this screen a little bit smaller uh, so that I can show you how things work. Okay. Let me see if I can put this one on my code here, right? Let me. So that should be an easier one for us rather than flipping screens, okay? Uh, we'll come back to this whenever we need this. So I say M V N W. Uh, uh, Quarkus dev, we should take compile. Uh, let's, let's keep it running so that like it's easy for us to get a bigger screen uh, and then do things up, right? So let things up to right. So then this is rare and then this is right. Okay. So this is your this is your traditional way of doing application. Now little let's a little bit more go a little bit interesting, right? I want to show you a few things before that. Okay. So with this Quarka stuff, so you can go to uh, the community and then there's lots of guides here. I just want to get you those two guides so where you can start exploring stuff. Okay. And then the guides are distributed based on extensions, what we call extensions to Quarkus. In Quarkus world, extensions are nothing but the dependencies that I add to my application, which were Quarkus, right? I said that there's a process by which Quarkus builds those jar, right? Right now, we have all these kind of uh, classifications, 
of of the dip, I mean the extensions. Uh, and extensions are nothing but a bunch of dependencies that you get at. We'll see one extension soon in, the, in a fraction of seconds. I uh, can also write your own extensions. There is also a section is writing it, which is more advanced thing, which you're not going to talk right now. But we have a core web data messaging, all of the stuff, right? So which you can go right down. You can follow these guides, which are ready made, ready made examples are also available, which you can use to get these things done. Okay. So what we'll right now we'll go do is right. I'm just going to go and add a database dependency here. Okay. So I have a doc compose probably. So which basically runs a, a PostgreSQL, right? I'm just going to start a PostgreSQL now. Okay. So let me go there. Uh, I'm just going to say scores. And then I should say Docker compose. Right? So this is going to start me uh, a PostgreSQL server, which is a DB and a password here. The server is started here. And I also have a, a, a web socket, I mean, web layer also attached to that so that we can also see the thing, right? So let's go here. So I started the database. Let's go back to our application. Now, how do I add an extension? So to do a database application, all I require is that I need Hibernate and the driver, right? So that's what I'm going to do right now. Those are two little extensions to get started with. So let's uh, let's do that first. To do that, go to the command palette again, and then there is a command which says Quarkus add extensions. Okay. So when I do this, so it's going to say me what extensions I want. I should say JDBC. I say PostgreSQL, ORM, Hibernate ORM, and then I'm going to say I'm going to choose first these two things right now. Okay. And Panache. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to Panache in a second. ORM, Panache. Uh, okay, this one. All right. So these are the three things which you want to do. I have a JDBC driver. I have an ORM or Ibernet based ORM, and then I'm good to go here. Okay. And they say enter. Now what happens? Your purpose is going. Extension is going to get added. And now what happens? Your project is get added, and your application gets reloaded automatically. Okay. So that you see this, the application was reloaded, and now we get a bunch of extensions. You see this one happening right now automatically for you. I said. It's not only that your classes get reloaded, even if your dependency is changed, Quarkus recompiles that thing and reloads your application. This is a sheer developer joy, right? You don't need to wait for these things to happen. Things things happen automatically. Okay. So we have fruit right now. So let's go and add an entity. Okay, that's what we're going to do right now. So let's go here and then I'm going to say new file called us fruit. Okay. Okay, job. Right? So this is a class right now. I'm going to have fruit class here, and then this is going to be an entity for me. Okay. Because this is entity, and then I'm going to have public, uh, I say, string uh, season and public string name. Okay. These are the only little things I'm going to have for this demonstration. Okay. So this is a traditional way you create an entity, right? So this is what we happen. So let's go here and then do an entity as well. I'm just going to format this a little bit. And now I'm going to add some JDBC properties, right? I should say, let me go and say a few things that right? is technically required. I should say uh, data source, uh, the JDBC.URL. Uh, I don't know why my thing is scrambled like this this time. Okay, so let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger, okay? The DB kind, I should say. This is PostgreSQL. First thing I'm doing. And then I should say JDBC URL. Say JDBC URL. Okay. All right. Uh, JDBC colon PostgreSQL. Let's copy this from here. Colon slash slash local host. Five four three two, and then if I remember, the database name was demo. Okay, or demo DB. Let's go and find this out. So that's going to be demo DB. Okay, that's the one which you have here. Okay, that's going to say this, and then obviously I have to specify the user and password that I need to connect this to, right? So that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, Quarkus uh, uh, data source, JDBC dot user name if I remember correctly that should be the one 
let's demo and password i'm just going to say password that's also going to be demo password sorry. all right so this is a very basic information that is required for us to get started with the entity right i'll give you other things just to show how things happens behind the scene or um, uh, log sql uh okay uh, let me go grab this one okay so we go here to my tutorial and then uh hibernate with panache this is where we are in we saw about basics and fundamentals how do we create and then we saw about configurations how we use property right now and then using config property and all other stuff we are right here at doing the uh this one right right i just do this quarkus.orm database generation so that my DBs get created on and off immediately. And also there is also something called as dot log SQL, right? This is the one. So log SQL. So that uh, you can see the schema getting created on the logs, right? So that's what I'm going to do too. So this is the more of a database configuration. I have I have a database data source. These are standard ones. All I need to prefix that with Quarkus dot data source. I created all these stuff, and then now the database is happening and right there. And then they are running right now. Okay. So if I go and give a reload again, as usual, so I'm just going to split the screen for convenience. Uh, so you should see my application getting reloaded in a fraction of a second. Obviously, expect an error right now. I'll tell you what error is that. Okay. So this is what is going to happen right now. I'm just going to say uh, in local host, HTTP, API fruits. Boom, that's an, that's an error, right? So what's this error talks about, right? I told that we are going to get an error. There is no identity specified, right? Because there's no identifier specified on my entity. Okay, so what is panache? Okay, that's where I'm going to get the panache in. If you see panache, so when you create, if you do any kind of a database, CR, UD operation with ORM, with Java and other stuff, the basic things you always do is like a lot of CR, UD operations, save versus delete, select, okay? There will be lots and lots of boilerplate code, including defining entity, identity, et cetera, et cetera. That's first thing. And also, like, we'll usually follow the two patterns, like DAO and service pattern. We have DAO and service together. So we always do this, right? With Panache, what we did is that so we took all those boilerplate code and the common patterns that is used in database-based application development and then back them as an entity class that will give you lots of functionality, okay? So that's what I'm going to do right now. What I'm going to say right now is that make this class extends panache entity. Okay. Already, if you remember that I added this dependency panache here, that's part of a dependency chain right now. If you see this here, overnight or panache, I added that as an extension. So you can read more about that on our guides. But this is what we did right now. I added this already. So I made this panache right now. And when I load my application now, so this should go and load my application properly, right? So what basically happened right now, let me say this. I gave an entity right now. And what else happened? I'm unable to, it's not able to connect to the database. No password is provided. I did not provide the password. I didn't give that. Um, OK, let me go and change. Uh, this thing let me go see what's this one okay so database user name let me grab from one of my existing projects to see what i have uh, let me go here to github uh, maybe i missed some properties uh, uh, demo check the quarters branch SRC and resources, application properties. Uh, okay, data source of UCB. I'm sorry. So, it's my mistake. Data source. So, I'm sorry about that. That's, that's the uh, typical mistake from my side. And then now we go. You can see the uh, you see the table getting created for you right now on the on the on the uh, thing. So let's go and watch. I think I told you that I deployed a little utility 
So uh, local host uh, 99p, and it's, this is called as DB admin. Uh, so I'm just going to use PostgreSQL here and then say demo password demo, right? That's what we did, and then do a login. And you see the fruit table got created, and then you saw nothing will be there in this right now, okay? So our database is ready. So my application is ready to talk to database, right? And let's do a very first thing, right? So let's change this one, this method which is returning a default fruit to go and return me, change this method name to be fruits. But let's do this fruit dot usual thing. What we do is fruit dot list all, okay? So this is standard one, and then I say a response here, and then I just construct a response builder. New response builder. But build. Okay. Start. We follow this document. Uh, okay. All right. For the simplicity, let me put this way. Okay. Uh, let's return this one back here. Just like this. Let me go and see what's the right thing for that, right? Um, it should go to the list of fruits, that's it. So that should be okay. So say list of fruits. We have our doodle. Okay. The response is a much neater way to do things, but uh, let's go with this. This is going to list the list of fruits, but you'll be wondering that I have this list all, but where is these things coming from, right? That's the, again, a magic that has been done with Panache Entity. In Panache Entity, we have the abstract class. We have baked in lots of methods, utility methods. It's already there that can do this job for you, right? You don't need to write them. Just write those two entity columns or the database columns that you require, and then it's going to take care of this. This is a, this is a part of Panache Entity because I don't need to write those, those traditional CRUD kind of code again and again and again, right? So I don't need to do that. Okay, this is what I'm going to do right now. Let's go here and do this thing, okay? But now you don't get anything because I don't have any fruit. So what I'm going to do right now is going to go and create a fruit thing, right? Just say import.sql. So this is the usual way which you do for development. I'm just going to copy some stuff from uh, this code here, which I have. So I'm just going to go here and then copy some stuff from there. Uh, I'm just inserting some fruits inside this. And now what basically happens is that since this import.sql is already there, so Panache, I mean, Hibernate ORM and Quarkus will go and search for the path and find if there is an import there, then it's going to go and load the schema for you, right? That's what is going to happen. If you watch this thing right now, this is going to say all these things right now, it's loads lots of fruit for you. So did it load now? Uh, import.sql and then this should load the database for us okay so let's go i think let's explicitly specify that property saying that uh, what the property name that is so that's going to be let me go and find this out for you okay it's hard to remember all the stuff i'm just going to say the load script which is going to load here for me i'm just going to say here load that for me from import sql and then now i go and say fruits now it's going to give me all the fruits, right? The fruit got inserted here, and I get a bunch of fruits from my database. You'll see a series of insert statements happening earlier, insert into, and uh, let's go and change, see that in the database as well, right? So this is what happening. And then I get select fruit, and all my fruits is here, okay? And your ad is going to be so easy as well. As a database developer, I'm also going to go and say post, okay? And this is a transactional. Thing. So I need to add transaction and then say public void uh, add fruit. Okay. Okay, there's going to be fruit that's going to be added. And then I say uh, fruit dot persist. Okay. And uh, response. Okay. 
let's not worry about that. But obviously, I need one more dependency for this to work. Rest easy, JSON B. If I have this, or you can use any kind of your JSON parsers. Uh, but we'll use Rest easy, JSON B here. Okay, you already have that, so we don't need to worry about that. It's already added as part of the Quarkus Rest easy thing. So now with this, what I can also do is like I have add fruits right now. That's done. Let me go and say, okay, I need to change a path, right? And say path. Add, okay, I just say add fruit. Uh, let's say uh, HTTP, sorry, API fruit slash add name equal to uh, jackfruit season. I just say all, okay, just for demonstration purpose, or it's a summer, okay. Now we see right now what happened. This insert also happened for me. There is no content because it's just addition right now to the fruit. And then if you go to the database right now uh, and then see the fruit is also added. Now, if you see all these database operations, what I've been doing right now, if all these operations are done without reloading or restarting my application. If you see on the left hand side of this, this is a shared developer join. I don't need to start anything. I keep adding functionalities and I keep changing my properties or add dependencies or add SQL commands. Or anything I do, I don't actually need to restart my database. I restart my Java application, or which is usually we used to do. And this makes you develop application much more faster. So one last thing we also want to see here, it's not that I cannot use anything on this class. I can just go and add one method. Let's say I want to add a method uh, list of fruits. Okay. Uh, find by season. Okay. String, just go. Let me make it a little bigger here. Okay, uh, string season. Okay. And now, what I'm going to do is like, I'm just going to say find a query. I can say season because that's one of my properties I have. Okay. I'm going to find by season and then I'm going to pass this season, just going to come here, dot list. Okay, so that's going to return me a list of fruits. We see this, you'll be wondering where this method is coming from. This method is already baked into Panache. As I said that we took all those boilerplate patterns of the application that we deployed and made them viable and then given into Panache. So which means that my application is already ready to do the job for me. Okay, let's add one method for that. I'm just going to copy this one. Okay, and then get, and then I say path season. Okay, and then I'm going to say fruit, get fruit by season, and then I say fruit by season. And then I say path param season, and then okay, a little bit. Uh, for some reason, my thing is not doing its job correctly. Okay, so I'm just going to say season, and then what I'm going to do fruit dot find what this method we gave find all by season, and that's it. I'm still not stopping my application, my application is still running. I'm just going to pass a season here, which is going to return me all the fruits by season, right? So, um, okay, this is, should be static, okay. So now what happens, I have find by season method added to this and this application is getting loaded here for you. And then now let me go and say fruit by summer, right? Get me all the fruits uh, which are on summer, right? I've not done case sensitive, so I have to be this thing. So you see this, I just go to say, uh, select all fruits. So which are going to be from summer, which I should say, I should say, put. let me put winter, okay? So I get two fruits, okay? If you see this, I got two fruits, which are orange and grapefruit, which are for winter. And without, again, doing a very simple thing, I have all the methods available for me. And then I just went and added those, we use those methods. There's lots of methods you can go and explore, which is kind of made this application available for you to up and run it, okay? So we're all good here. So one little thing which you also can do right now is that, so let me go and change this one. Uh, my property let's see how we can deploy that to a cloud okay so that's the only thing the one last thing which i want to show you guys how to deploy things into cloud okay 
So let me have this name as PostgreSQL because I'm going to deploy a PostgreSQL on the thing. I have an OpenShift application server running here. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to deploy a database. Okay, if you have not seen OpenShift, then it, what you can do is like, I just, I'm just wanting to put this one, uh, HTTP, uh, TPS, uh, try dot open, OpenShift dot com. So chaift.com. You can go grab one, get your cluster here as well. I think there's also a few things just running around. You should be soon able to get your board cluster to try that out. Uh, let's go and do a database. Uh, I'm going to use a ephemeral. Okay, let me not use let me use a ephemeral one because I'm not going to save anything right now. Uh, I call this as PostgreSQL as a service name. And let's take the same connection username, demo. And the password, I'm just going to use so that I don't need to change any of these properties. Uh, password here, okay. And the database name is also demo, okay. That's what I'm going to do. And then I say create the database for me. My database is going to get created in a fraction of seconds inside Kubernetes, which is OpenShift, which is your enterprise Kubernetes. Let's give some time for this to get generated. While this happens, what I'm going to do is like, I'm just going to run Again, a bunch of Maven commands that is going to take this application and deploy this into production. Okay, so inside your thing, right? It's going to be the other game. Okay, let's stop this server up right now. Okay. Uh, I'm going to add one client, if I remember correctly, that's going to be on the fruit app. I need to add one extension, uh, which is called OpenShift. Or you can also have Kubernetes if you want to deploy to Kubernetes. Both of them are allowed. I'm just going to say open shift here and then enter. That's going to get my extension added to my application. So that's going to be a little extension that was added. Let me uh, make this this side and this one on this side. Okay. So that like it's easy for me to show you those things. Okay. So what I'm going to do right now is just going to go. I think if you want to follow this guide, this guide is right here onto the cloud section, uh, onto your thing, and then deploy application to Kubernetes. So this is what I'm going to do right now, okay? I added this container image right now. I'm just going to do image in one shot, uh, in separate steps, that's what I'm going to do. But for the simplicity sake of that, I'm just going to do it in one step, okay? I'm just going to copy this command. You can go watch this. I think this is pretty much same as what I have right now. So. So what I'm going to do to my application, let me put this guy also this side so that I can, you can see the application getting deployed in a second. Okay. I'm just going to go here. I add everything ready. My fruit app is now going to land with this one single command. My fruit app is going to get landed inside OpenShift that is there in your cloud. Okay. So that's what you're going to see right now. The tests are being run, blah, blah, blah. And then soon you'll see the application up and running right here. Okay. One little command, one little extension that you're going to add here. That extension is, okay, I'll skip the test. Sorry. Uh, because my tests are not ready. So I'll just say B, skip test. Okay. Because my, I've not prepared my test cases. So this is going to run this one for you. And then take the application and deploy this one little thing. Add one extension called as OpenShift extension, or if you are, have a raw cube cluster, mini cube or something, you can just do mini cube Kubernetes uh, extension that you can just add. And then once that is added, you just need to create this project, right? You can follow the same thing like what I did right now. And all I have to do is just, just type one command, uh, which is going to just here, as I said earlier, uh, Corcus Kubernetes deploy. That's it, right? So your application is going to land right here, okay? I'll show you what all is happening right now, right? The application has started, and you'll see see the build which is happening, right? The fruit hub build which is happening right here in your cloud. Okay, it's not happening on your machine, it's happening on your cloud. As you see, it's doing a performance OpenShift binary build inside my cloud. Okay, so this is what is happening right here for you guys in, in my namespace. Okay, so it will take a fair bit of seconds because it has to download all the Maven artifacts and do. And, and do the Maven build here. So the, this thing is getting pending because it's still running. Let's go and see the logs. So something gets streamed up here from here to there. So let's start, let's wait for that. They see me the STD in, okay? Things are starting to move now. And uh, let's wait for some time. So if you go here, and then it's kind of pushing the things up from here to there, okay? 
So let's go and see what happens right now. Things are getting copied and then it gets deployed and you should see soon see the things here, right here. Okay. You should also see the application up and running in fraction of seconds uh, in this space. Okay. So let's wait for that. And obviously, I don't see any questions on the chat. Okay, so let me give some time here for this to happen. Uh, let's see if there is any questions on the on the chat. Okay, you see see this one, the Quarters Foods app is right now up and running in the cloud okay this is happening in the cloud for you there's a database which is going to get, get there if you go to logs and then see the logs you should also see it's getting connected to the database and showing all the logs so let's let's make it a little bit bigger so that we can see the log uh, let's see when the application gets started okay you see there's insert and everything happening right now and it should also create you a route so that i can also access the application from outside world but usually we restrict it, but for demonstration purpose, we do this. I say OC expose Oops, app. So that's the command that I need to give to expose this stuff. Uh, that's all. I think uh, it should it should give you a URL. Okay, so it's expose stuff. Uh, expose SVC, and you should get a URL right now. And then when I click on this. I just see the app, right? So our path was slash API slash fruits. Right? Okay, so I just need to do a edge termination here. Let me go here. This is the last thing I'm going to show before we wrap up. Uh, so I just need to because it's it cannot go from HTTPS to HTTP. So I have to go terminate it at edge. It's termination. Okay. Uh, okay, this is reloaded. And now when I go and do this, I should get the JSON thing of all the fruits, right? And that's it. So with this, what happens is that I can just do back and forth with the cloud. I don't need to stay locally. I can keep doing the build, deploy, build, deploy cycles along with that so that my application get deployed on the cloud within a fraction of seconds okay so that's that's the power of what we do with this i think uh and that's pretty much i have uh to cover for the say we start about cloud native we can go watch this thing for offline why we do this and then there's a bunch of resources that i have uh which i can do uh, right there and i also put down the quarters uh, community link where you can go and chat with the developers engineers and all these peoples okay and there's a cookbook for you, uh, which is also available, and a bunch of resources. Uh, with that, so I should say that we are almost top of the hour. And probably I should say, like, uh, that's pretty much I have. And thanks for attending my session. Uh, obviously, please do drop for those questions, whatever you might have. We'll be happy to take your questions. With that, uh, it's back to you, uh, Daniel.